Okay, so this uh, I came out of uh, some work related to the book that I've just been involved with, um, co-editing. And it's about um, some, some issues that came up, which is related to, uh, to, to what gets measured. And so hence the, the title of what I uh, have here. And I'm going to, look, to say some brief words about the nature of the evidence that exists on gender and en energy. And primarily um, to, to make a reflection about numbers and about quantitative uh, data. And it, this is in the context of SDG 7, which is the energy uh, SDG and SDG 5, which is the gender. Uh, SDG. And uh, then just finish off with some reflections on, um, on you know, what my suggestions on what people could do if they're interested in this as a research uh, area. So first of all, I mean, what's the nature of the evidence? Well, hmm, yes, yeah. Um, it's the, the evidence splits between, not surprisingly, between the global south and the global north. And the, the interest started in gender and energy related in the global south. And that goes back to the 1980s, in which uh, for, I suspect that I'm actually speaking to somebody who wasn't even born in, the, in, in when this actually ha happens, is that uh, it's the, there was what was known then as the fuel wood crisis, that uh, deforestation was leading to a shortage of fuel wood, which was uh, impacting on um, households and their cooking needs. So that's just a, a, sort, of a, a sort of nail uh, summary of some nail summary of what, what this topic was about. In the global north, gender and energy hasn't really uh, been of a particular interest from social science perspective. Well, from any perspective, but particularly, I think I'm speaking to a social science audience primarily about uh, this millennium. So it's, it's really only within the last 20, 20 years. So the body of empirical evidence, so now, and I'm particularly talking now about to an academic audience, that the empirical evidence that is scientifically produced is actually very small. Most of the work that's been done has tended to be qualitative. Now, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with, with that, and I suspect most of the audience doesn't either, but it's, a, it's based on small sample sizes. Now, the reason that can be a problem is if you want to influence policy. Policymakers love numbers, right? And so that if you uh, have small case studies, then they, they have a role to play, but it's, it's big numbers that count. Now, in the global south, most of the evidence tends to come from practice. So again, with lacking, uh, well, I would say not always done with good um, rigorous uh, attention to research methods, with a, it is, the focus has been on women in, in terms of household energy and, on, and as entrepreneurs in the energy chain particularly at the lower end of the uh, chain of selling things. Very little emphasis on getting women in higher up in the chain of designing things. Most of the work has been framed by the World Bank and the UN agencies. So this tends to be a very heavy emphasis on, um, eco on the economic dimensions with the, the, the uh, proviso that economic uh, independence leads to, uh, to women's um, agency and to gender equality. Now, in the global north, it, the, the emphasis has been uh, slightly, uh, slightly different. It's the, primarily the focus has been on energy poverty and um, women in the energy industry. And this, is, this has been primarily much more academic research. And I would say here that the University of Durham has played actually, Peter, a very important role in, in this. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm, you know, that you've invited me to this in this webinar, that uh, a lot of the very early work in Europe has actually come from the UK on, uh, on energy uh, poverty. On the, one, on the other hand, it's not something to be proud of that you have so much energy poverty that it's actually so, so, such a, an area of uh, significant research. The other aspect has been women in the energy industry. 
And so now the, the framing of much of the work in, the, in Europe has been by um, the European Parliament, particularly the FEM Committee which has stressed uh, the gender dimensions of, uh, of, the, of, of energy, which I think is, is, is uh, something quite, uh, quite significant. Now then, I was saying, to, well, do I mentioned about quantitative, qualitative uh, research, well, do numbers matter? Um, well, yes, in the sense of if you, if you want your, your work to influence, then without any data, there is no visibility. And with no visibility, there's no interest. So I think that numbers do, do matter. Um, yeah, policymakers like numbers. They feel safety in numbers, you know, that they, uh, that they are something that they can feel uh, tangible towards. Now, th like any policy uh, that, and I'm particularly thinking of the SDGs here, they use it indicators and metrics to establish baselines. You know, how many gas, uh, you know, sort of wood stoves are people cooking with, you know, and how many solar panels have they got on their roof? So, so, uh, so that sort of be uh, metrics is used. But I, I'm one of the things that has come from the, the sort of interaction with, with, uh, with, with the with a book um, that I've been involved with, is, is it, it came very evident about what we count and how we count matters. And I'm going to give you some examples of that in a, in a, in a little while. But it came out that really an over-reliance on numbers leads to depersonalization and depoliticization. That the, the numbers disguise who is behind those numbers. What, what, what are the real lives that are being lived, lived here? And also, it depoliticizes that it doesn't say that this is a you know a neoliberalist uh, agenda for uh, for you know this this particular change. This is what because the numbers say we need to do this. So that's that's an int interesting. And also, with there is a tendency for uh, that there can be a tendency for box ticking. Now, um, and that comes from. And an example of this is, you know, sort of that um, getting women onto committees or women into the energy uh, industry. And equal numbers is taken as a proxy for gender equality. But there's then nothing about, well, there is, I say nothing. I mean, there, there is some research to look at what happens after women get there to the committee or to the energy uh, industry. And there's little thinking, and I, here I particularly thinking of the global, global South, that um, the women always have the, the skills to contribute to, uh, say, a village energy committee or a solar, you know, solar panel uh, project. And in, in many cultures, there is also behavioral norms that need to be overcome. For example, do, do women speak in public if men are present? So, so that, that, and you can have a, a person in a room, but if they don't speak, what contribution do they, are they able to make? Now, for those of you who are British, this, is, this next statement should not come as a surprise that not all sisters are signed up to sisterhood. Um, if I mention the name Margaret Thatcher, more recently, Theresa May, um, our current Home Secretary, um, I think we can question their sisterhood uh, credentials. But I mean, that's, that's uh, maybe a political uh, statement, but in, in fact, that there is very little conclusive evidence that women in positions of authority are more likely than men to represent women's interests. That's, that's sad, but it appears to be what the evidence at least that's available at the moment shows. And the other thing is that uh, what you tend to get is you're pushing women into such positions, then they take over the responsibility for gender equality. That it becomes their job to do to do this and not to, um, you know, and, and but gender equality is a joint project. It's something that both men and women have the, the responsibility for. And also that they should that, that also putting women into committees also needs men to have their capacity trained and built as well to make space for, for, uh, for, for, for women as well to, to, uh, to, to participate. 
but then going back to the numbers though, but where does the, where does the counting stop? Is it just simply a question of, you know, well, I think it's what happens is just as how many solar, you know, solar panels, how many uh, clean cook stoves are uh, introduced, but nothing really about six months later, what's happened? Has uh, all the uh, things um, taken place? Now, there's, there's lots of assumptions go on into what's going to happen when you do an energy intervention. First of all, women, it, uh, women are categorized as a homogeneous group. And this, is, this is completely misunderstands that there are also power relationships between women, particularly in, in some in, you know, sort of intergenerational power relations. Also, there are rich women, there are poor women. There are educated women, non, not so well educated women. So it's 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 a fallacy also to, uh, with this this uh, that gender is men women. It's much more complicated than that. And I've got an example also that comes from a type of of, of well I call it uh, stereotyping of what perceived notions of what women um, and men uh, th their behavior is. And this comes from some of the work that uh, Peter mentioned, my involvement with Energia. Energia did more recently a, um, a rather large research program to try to generate some of the numbers that were, were missing uh, for, for evidence. But it's in, in the Global South, women, Many women are involved in informal sector enterprises. Uh, there's, there's good reasons for, for that, which I don't have time to go into, but the outside perception of this, particularly people with funding or you know, sort of any policy makers tend to think that these are survivalist. They're not interested in developing enterprises that they give uh, that the, the income is, you know, so it's, it's just what in English used to be called pin money. It's small, small sums that have got really much uh, relevance and certainly not for investing in the enterprises. Now, the consequences of this the, uh, are that the informal sector gets overlooked. Yet the informal sector, if you actually look at the data from ILO, plays a very big part in the economy. It tends, it's not measured, its economic contribution doesn't appear generally in GDP data, but it's there. And it provides services often for low-income households. So it's it's it, but so its role is important, but it's overlooked. And the evidence does show that, that some women do want to. They have ideas, but no one asks them. No one provides them with the support or the, the, uh, the assistance that they could do to, uh, to, to develop those enterprises. There are also assumptions about outcomes for, for, for women. If we, do an enterprise, if we do a project, then this is what is going to, to happen. And thinking back to what I said about who frames this in, in the global South, that the uh, that is, and this goes back to what I said, first started the interest in gender and energy in the global South about fuel wood. The focus is, is, has been for decades on fuel wood. And it, it is, it does take time to collect, it's true. So that the, the framing of this now becomes, if we save time on fuel wood collection, there's time then for women to, gen to go into business. They, or they can get a job, they can earn money. However, if you actually ask women, this is not necessarily their priority. Income generation, yeah, saving time, of course, yes. But this, the assumption is that it's always women's job to collect fuel wood. Not in all cultures, it isn't. It's men's, or sometimes it's joint, sometimes it's children. So, but if you frame it in this particular way, then, then often it can end up with misdirection and a, fa a project uh, failure. If you ask women, water collection is often their higher priority because they, they need to collect it because it's not, it's not on tap, they have to collect it two, three times a, a day. Whereas fuel wood, it tends to be less, less frequent. And so they, if you ask them, this is what they would put as a higher priority. But if you look at irrigation projects, they tend to be irrigation for agriculture, 
and not for um, not for um, not for household use. And a lot of women will say, "Oh, great, free time! I can have some rest. I already work a long day. Why not let me have a, a, a sit down with my kids?" And so that's uh, and that's what you will find that uh, is that uh, income generation is not always taken taken up. There is an assumption that women's earning, if women earning an income, leads to their increased agency, that they have more control over their lives and that say in what households, uh, what happens within households. But the evidence is, this is a rather simplistic assumption, and the evidence shows that life is more complicated, that who, who does what and where between men and women in what uh, they do is is much more dependent upon a number of factors than just simply earning, uh, earning a, a living. Now, I have to say a lot, of, well, although I talk about gender and energy, most of the, the, the research actually is about women and energy and not about gender and energy, and particularly in the global, global South. So, but men also, there, is a, there are some studies for, but, um, particularly from uh, by IDS uh, at Sussex, that, uh, that men also benefit from energy interventions. And with women earning an income, then they see it as more shared responsibility, that they see this as less stress of having to, to uh, provide for their household. So that's on the positive side. But on the negative side, there is evidence to show that if women start to earn an income, then some men will reduce their contribution to the household budget so that the actual overall benefit to the household doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't change. Now, um, the, there is a if we're going to, to look then at gender, how does this get into the numbers? Well, the gender disaggregation is, is at the present moment, if it's done at all, so there is very, the, the actual data is, is, is difficult to find, is, between, is, is disaggregated at the level of the household head. And it's again, we're back into two homogeneous groups ignoring the, the fact that um, households differ across a range of socioeconomic categories. Trying to get that, that disaggregated data also is, very, is very difficult. Another, another issue is what's a household? How do you define a household? A household is not a static entity. It's complex, its composition is complex, and it's fluid, that it changes over, over time. And the time period can be short, it can be over, over uh, years. And it's not necessarily confined to a single physical structure or geographic location. And so, and so it's context that matters. You have to understand the context in which you are, are working. And if you are sitting in Washington trying to understand what is happening in you know, Botswana or uh, in you know, sort of differences between households, that's, that's, that's quite difficult to, uh, to, 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 to grasp. The, I, I would suggest one of the reasons for, for, for in terms of policy making now, rather than you know, ac academic interest, uh, is that um, if you have an understanding of difference, then you can do more targeted actions rather than generic solutions, which is one of the arguments for, for that. But I would say, looking at what has happened in the UK in terms of the winter fuel allowance, now I suspect that most of you, apart from me, don't qualify for the winter fuel allowance. Um, the winter fuel allowance is a, is a sum of money that is given to anybody over 65. It's meant to counteract that what is a cheerful subject known as excess winter mortality. More people die in winter than in summer, um, and they and that is very age related. So that and there is a, a, a based on very good research done in the UK and in Ireland on on uh, energy poverty. It's shown that if you have a better heated home, then the excess winter mortality figures de decline. 
However, if you start to means test, then those who need it most don't apply or tend not to. So the num so that so that's a, re a reason for having this generic winter fuel allowance. And the, the, it's good data that, to show how this does uh, does work. And of course, this does, the gender benefits of this, of course, are that women tend to be uh, more in the older age group because they tend to live longer than uh, the men, but tend to live more in uh, in energy poverty. So then think about this and who decides on what to research? Okay, so I'm now not thinking of as we, you know, sort of academics sitting there thinking, oh yeah, I want to do this, that and the other. You have to apply for funding, right? So that's changed a lot since I was a, a student. Uh, that, um, and if you look at the gender and energy research, most of the money is related to wood fuels. And particularly that would link to the statement that wood fuels, burning wood fuels in a closed environment is bad for your health. And so vast amounts of money have gone, and rightly so. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I'm not complaining in one sense about this, but the focus has been on smoke in inhalation. And, you know, sort of, you know, this is bad for you, and how can we do something about it? So that's, 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 and if you, something will come on to in a, in a moment, but that all leads back from the 1980s, from that whole fuel wood uh, situation. However, this is not the only problem that you, health problem that you acquire by using fuel wood. That there is also, this fuel wood tends to be carried on somebody's head, usually a woman's, sometimes in town where it's sold, it'd be a man, but usually it's a woman's head. And she's, you know, maybe carrying 20 kgs for 30, 40 years. And there is, there is some evidence, notice I say some evidence, I mean, okay, intuitively it tells you this is not good for you. But of course, if you want something done about it, you have to provide the evidence. And when it's anything to do with health, there are very strict, uh, you know, sort of methodological procedures about what counts as evidence and what is conclusive evidence. So, but if, um, a, um, um, Maggie Matinga in her uh, PhD, uh, uh, for her PhD research, she, tr she tried to find the, the medical evidence on this. And the, uh, the number of papers that are actually published on this are really, in an academic sense, are very small indeed. And there is also the whole issues related to physical and sexual harassment, which we know anecdotally happen. But trying to get the actual evidence on this is is very is very difficult and with it with the the group uh, that we produced the book we've we've been sort of scratching our heads about this why 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 is this the case what's driving this and we do wonder um if it's maybe because there is a huge set of, of medical expertise linked to tobacco research just that sort of smoke inhalation Another possibility is because you can measure it in situ. You now you can put something that measures, the, you know, the quantity of uh, pollution in in a in a fixed environment. And yet, to, that you, that's very much more difficult to do in terms of skeletal damage, musculoskeletal damage. And also, the the, the work that the evidence based around harassment is mainly linked to displaced person camps. So, and that's anecdotal evidence. So, so that's, I mean, it's also then when people do the research, who owns the data and who collects the data? And then for this then is, it's generally an outsider to a community who's going to draw attention to the problem. In this case, uh, indoor or household air pollution as it's now known. The knowledge is generated from the outsider, what is uh, is known as the ethic uh, perspective, and not the subject of the proposed studies. Now, and any knowledge that's generated tends to remain within formal medical or energy circles. It's this, this 
expensively generated uh, data is not making its way down the chain to the people who are supposedly, uh, well, supposedly who are at, at risk. However, if you ask the people who are suffering from this exposure what they, what they think, they don't see this as a problem. They see it as something they grew up with. It's part of their life. It's part of their existence. And this is also, interestingly, what village healthcare workers also see, because most of these, they come from those communities. And they see that, but these are healthcare workers, these are professionals, these are chained. But if you look at the curriculum they follow, household air pollution is not part of that curriculum because it's not part of the northern derived medical curriculum. Now I will add, I didn't put it here, I'm trying to not write too much on the slides, but I will say that now this, is, this issue has been picked up by the uh, Global Alliance on Clean Cooking and that they are, they're running its own experimental uh, curriculum in Ghana. So at least that is beginning to be addressed, but how long it will take to, to get through is uh, to, to get a more global acceptance is, uh, well, I don't like to think about that. Now, there is evidence to show that if you do allow people to formulate problems from their own perspective, the emetic perspective, then you can get positive outcomes. I um, mean, the Philippines, a set of grassroots health workers worked with their, their villagers to identify what they considered were the, the, the health priorities, which they then produced a completely different set of statistics to the official uh, statistics. And when they worked on the priorities of what the villagers saw, then they actually produced a much better uh, impact on, uh, on mortality rates in the villages. So, so by taking a different approach, then you get a, a more positive uh, result. Well, how's the data collected? Well, if it's rapid sample surveys, which tends to be the, uh, the, the standard, then they don't always provide explanation. That ah, the villages are still using fuel wood. They're still collecting fuel wood, even though they've been, they've, uh, been given uh, or acquired clean cooking uh, stoves. Huh? Well, if you actually understand why that is the case, then in this particular community where this research was done, that your, the size of your fuel wood stack, which you leave outside your front door, is a measure of how good a wife or a um, or a good mother you are. So it's, it's an, a, a norm, a value judgment of your society. And that sort of thing is very difficult to, to, uh, to over, overcome. And also, I mean, I, I have to say, I'm a big fan of ethnographic uh, work. I know it's expensive, time consuming, but ethnographic work produces a lot of very valuable uh, insights, I think. And also, if you spend a lot longer in the community, including overnight, then uh, you build trust, particularly uh, to talk about more sensitive uh, issues, which, you know, to say, for example, leading to sexual harassment while uh, collecting uh, fuel wood. Now, now to say something on the, the SDGs. Um, the SDG 7 is, looks at two metrics. It looks at cooking and electricity. Cooking origins back in the 80s and electricity because, the, well, yes, electricity is electricity. Uh, they, have, um, uh, they have different ways of measuring um, access. They, they talk about energy access so, uh, to, uh, to energy, to modern energy, which they have different tiers of which they, uh, which they think. Uh, you know, households should should have access. You can argue about whether these you know these levels or whatever, but that's not what I wanted to really to talk about. The there is also the um, SDG seven on clean cooking. I want to say a little bit more about this. I mean, why cooking? This 
okay, yes, I know eating's important. <laughs> Having just had my lunch, I can assure, yes, that's, that's important. But there are other household energy services, I mean, that, they, that are required. So here I'm not talking about the energy itself, but the service it provides, because that's what people are interested in. And so water is just as important. And so there are household services and also non-household ones, health, having a well-equipped uh, well uh, local dispensary can, have, can improve all aspects of health. Education. So why, why do they take cooking? Okay, right. But they, the SDGs require gender disaggregated data. That you are, the countries are required to report on this from, for, but, but it is at the household head. It's based on the household head. So how do you define who is the household head? It's going to be the, it, it, when in doubt, if there's a man, he's the household head. So, so, okay, so that's one, one aspect of uh, some rather faulty data gathering, I think. Nothing about the social characteristics of the household. So nothing about income level, ethnicity. So th th there's very little disaggregated uh, data. And then no thoughts about the composition of the household. That's culturally context dependent. It, intergenerational households, polygamous households, no. And also needs differ depending on gender, age, physical mobility, but none of this is in the, the official uh, st uh, statistics. Now, this is something that where we need to down think about the, the Global North. This is where the Global North has a lot better data, which I think then sends um, signals to the, to the or should send signals to the SDG, uh, to, the, uh, to the UN and its SDGs. That the, as I mentioned before, there's been a lot of work done on, on energy poverty the eu eu and the uk also when it was part of the eu uh then it's it uses doesn't use energy access because it's assumed that everybody has access to clean energy so that's an assumption and that eu uses the the, uh, the term energy poverty whereas the uk uses fuel poverty there is no standard definition of what is meant by this. I put up, you know, a, just a, a generic uh, example, but the focus is on the vulnerable consumer. They are vulnerable to energy access, but, so, but framed in this term of energy poverty. Now, one of the dangers of assuming that everybody has access to uh, good, um, clean energy is that that's not true in Europe. I can't speak for the rest of the global, global North, but the, the data on is there certainly that there are women within the Europe, within Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe, who are cooking on fuel wood. And, but this does not get into the statistics and they are not being monitored for the impacts on their health. Now, what the data from, from Europe shows that age, age matters that um, this is data from 2016, Eurostat data, which shows that, um, at, and this is also another aspect of demographics is the number of people who live on their own. Around 30, just over 30% of households are, just have one person in them. And there is particularly an increase apparently in men living on their own, particularly in older age groups. And in, four out of 10 households are classified as elderly. So I think that means above six, age above 65. And they are much more vulnerable, as I mentioned before, to this thing of, of well, most of the research started in the global, in, in the UK. So it's, it's particularly winter it focuses on, but we must also think about the, the um, 
those countries where things were a lot hotter than uh, than in the UK. So, so that elderly people tend to be much more vulnerable to extremes of temperature, both cold and and heat. And the response to this, of course, is yes, well, if you can pay for it, you can solve your energy problem. But for women, now this is particularly um, of the, 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 that we're talking about today, is that many women who are at pension age don't have their own independent pension. They're entirely reliant on the <clears throat> male counterpart or the, the, state, the, the state pension. So that, that's one of the reasons for the, for the UK, at least for the, the winter fuel allowance. Now, I think the one thing, again, that I would say that the UK leads on is, is looking at at least at ethnicity. I think that the UK is the, I mean, I'm happy if somebody tells me I'm wrong on this, but I think that the UK is the only country with official statistics on ethnicity and energy poverty. Again, it's not something to be proud of, but on the other hand, it is drawing attention to the, uh, to the, to the issue that at least in 2015 of the households living in energy poverty, around 16% had declared themselves as part of, an ethnic, of the ethnic minority, whereas 10% had declared themselves as, as part of, the, of, uh, white, uh, of a white uh, background. So I think that that's also, this begins to show that this is important to look at this disaggregation of data. Now, this, this is a bit complicated, this diagram, and you can uh, follow it up in the, the, the work that I've done um, on uh, energy poverty in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the European Union, that income is only one driver of energy poverty that there are a lot more drivers of energy poverty. Of course, income helps, but it doesn't solve all problems if you are a tenant living in a house where the, the building stock is very poor quality. And the UK has very poor uh, building quality. The, the housing stock is very poor quality overall. Um, so that there are that there are distinct gender elements to the way that energy poverty and its and its outcomes. Particularly think about its older age group um, that are particularly vulnerable to to this. And I think here of particularly social stigma and mental well being that pe that older people at home all the time feel they cannot invite the neighbor for a coffee or a cup of tea because the house is too cold. And that, so that adds to social exclusion. And I think that we are very aware at the moment because of the last 18 months about what being locked up in the household does for, for, for people. Um, gender does matter in, in all of this. Um, that, in oh, this is some data on the excess winter deaths that um, it's only in England, Wales. Of course, in the UK, the, the, the different nations collect uh, different data separately. But for in, for certainly for uh, that's the data that shows more women die from uh, excess winter deaths than men. Um, there's some data. This is quite old data. This is in 20, uh, 2003 in France that when you get above a certain age, then, um, then you begin to see a differentiation um, of, between men and women about who suffers from uh, heat, uh, heat stress. And going back to one of those assumptions that um, if we produce um, a cook stove or a labor saving device, it saves time, then this will reduce um, women's, women's, this will lead to women's time saving. Uh, uh, uh. The energy, the, the data suggests that this is, this is a not, not true. The data comes from, uh, from, from Germany and looking at um, the use of the washing machine and women's time devoted to laundry, because they still tend to do the, be responsible for the laundry in, uh, in multi-occupancy uh, households, of course, um, is that other things change. We have far more clothes than we used to do 50 years ago. We have different standards. I, I, I can think of friends that I have who they wear something once and it goes in the washing machine. 
So, so that all that changes, and that also has implications for energy use, not only uh, gender uh, use. So, so making an assumption, you need to test uh, to test that. There is evidence to suggest that women living alone lose less energy than men. That's not a, not only a, that's not only in an older age group, but in a younger age age group, and this is linked possibly to lower appliance ownership. So, uh, so, but I say this is this is indicative data that needs some more uh, follow up, and that women household women headed households use more energy than male headed households, and this again is possibly linked to the fact that there is evidence to show that women tend to live in um, house in in housing stock that is of poorer insulation quality. So then. I'm coming near to the end. Uh, what to do about about this? I mean, I've given you some some uh, indications of what the, the evidence, what the data is showing. Well, I would certainly say that I think we've show, I've shown you that gender counts, but we certainly need more evidence. And I th I think that mixed methods is is the way to to go, and this should but this should be rooted in gender approaches and that any findings should be presented intersectionally. That, okay, starting with male, male, female helps, but it's not enough. And we need also to in understand intra-household inter data. Oh, yes, sorry, I forgot to mention that the UK has changed also. It doesn't use, it does not use automatically male, female household head. It uses um, a household reference person, I think the name, the, name, uh, the name is. And this can be anybody in the household. I think it has to be an adult, of course, but, it is, but still, that person has to know, do they know what the other person does in the household? I mean, I'm not sure what my other half is up to at the moment. So, uh, OK, um, so we need more inter-household uh, data. I would say to those of you who are qualitative people, try working with your quantitative colleagues. Uh, they're, they're quite nice, really. Um, and I do notice that there is a change in the air. I have noticed, sorry, Peter, <laughs> I noticed that my younger male colleagues tend to be much more open to, to gender issues. And so, well, maybe that's because I've hung around with engineers too, too long, I tend to be on men. So, but it's, um, I think that I do notice this in the students I teach. If I raise gender issues, I don't get the kickback that I had, say, 20, 25 years ago. And so I think that, it, I think that quantitative people are or also becoming much more aware of the need to have a better understanding of what their figures are, are, are showing. Do go for some ethnography. I think that's, it can do, be very revelatory. And to challenge assumptions. You know, those are the things that, uh, that, some of which I've touched on uh, now. One of the things that you may be of interest for you, and just as my last, my last uh, slide, is that um, Mariella Feinstra and I have been working on engendering the energy justice framework. I think some of you may already be familiar with this particular framework, which um, is, uh, is it's about um, distributive recognition of procedural justice and these are just the, these are the questions that one asks whether they're evaluative or normative and we of course say that this should be done through a gender lens and using gender analytical uh, methods but we've also suggested for policy making to make things more relevant to policy makers to make it more possibly more accessible for them is to use the th three categories of the economic aspects, the biological, physiological, and social cultural categories. And that, and also to remember that responses may not necessarily be in the energy sector, that responsibilities say may lie in the housing sector. 
So um, that finishes what I have to, to say. And I said, thank you for listening. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me, of course. And I'd like particularly to say thank you to these four uh, women, Maggie Matinga, uh, Maria Feinstra, and Mariah Koyman, and Ingrid Nelson. They, they well, three of them I've known quite some, some time. Um, and the, the work that they did to, in, in this book, uh, th that's made me think about what I've talked about to you to, uh, today. So I think, I think that's really very much appreciative of, uh, of what they have uh, done. And I see 22 things in, 20 things in the chat. Okay. Okay. All right, let's stop sharing that. Great, right, okay. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Joy. That was really, really interesting. And uh, yeah. Um, very provocative as well. Um, I've got lots of questions. There are lots of <laughs> questions in the chat. There's been quite a conversation in the chat. Oh, um, okay. Oh, uh, that's take a now, now, now it's my, I, I've got to try and find the questions um, that are in the chat out of all the, the conversation. Um, first first questions from Lavanya. Um, I don't know whether you'd like to, to turn your mic on, Lavanya, and, um, and read your question yourself, or I'm happy to read it otherwise. Oh, I see Lavanya's question. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, Lavanya. Sorry, yes, I am. I. So I should say, for the sake of the recording, I uh, I, I should read it out. Just oh, to, uh, of so, course you should. Yes, yeah. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so uh, Lavanya says, um, please elaborate on the point about gender and energy research in the global south. What kind of research gap did you find, and what suggestions could give could you give about the scope for research on gender and energy in the global south i think some of those things have been answered actually in your talk but mm -hmm. um, yes yeah. well i um uh, I, what i would suggest might be a good thing for you to look at is the energy uh, um the, the two reports that came out of the uh, gender and energy research program that uh, as was completed in 2019. I think that would answer a lot of, of, uh, of, of, of to give you an answer to that. I mean, there has been some really good work done in the Global South by, by academics. Um, uh, I, um, Govin Kelkar and Dev Nathan, uh, Soma Jutta, Indian, uh, Indian uh, researchers, T uh, Terry, the, the Energy Research Institute, they've also done quite a, some pr pretty good uh, work, I, I would say. There's been some in, in Nepal, but it has tended, with the exception of, of uh, Govin Kelkar, I would say, to look at household energy in terms of, of cooking. Some work on, um, on productive uses, um, Kelkar and Nathan have looked particularly at agriculture. And I think that's one of the things that they show also is that they, that is, is about context and about not focusing exclusively on the technology, but what else is going on. And I think one of the significant changes, if I understand correctly, in India has been the change in inheritance laws that women are able to inherit land or have and a land in their, in their name, which then it opens up a whole realm of issues for them that they, they can have access to, um, to, uh, to, to funding, for example, so, um, or loans. And it's changed their political influence too, from what I can understand, that they are now seen as a very credible, um, uh, a, um, uh, group who you want to win their votes votes for so so i think that that's what i would say it's it's primarily in that aspect and it's not relational it's not really apart from i keep saying mentioning govin because i suppose i know her work the best that um it tends to be about women's position rather than relational so i i if i hope that answers your your question <laughs> If not, uh... Lavanya says, yes, I asked her the question quite early, but uh, thank you so much. OK, right. OK. <laughs> um, we've, got a, we've got another question here that's just on um, what's the, the title and the authors of the book? That, the book um, uh, it's on the last slide, of course. Yes, yes yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Yes, it's engendering the energy transition. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I might. Um, I, I, I can't. Apologies for this. Uh, I can't see any other questions in the chat 
yet. There's one that uh, Marta's asked, um, but maybe uh, about the kinds of data that you used while talking about the UK research, uh, but apologizes because um, she joined late. Perhaps, um, I don't know whether you want to speak about that or whether kind of, I might direct Marta to the recording of the, of the talk later. Um, I, I think Marta, the, the the talk's going to be it has been recorded and will be uploaded um, uh, by about Wednesday next week. So if you if you want to have a quick chat just for the sake of others, um, perfect. That's great. Okay. Do we have any other questions from anyone else? I ha I certainly have a question. Oh, we've got uh, Natabi. And Natabi, she's got a question. She got the answer, <laughs> not the question. <laughs> Hello, Joy. Hello, Thank Ntabi. you so much for the presentation. It was great. Uh, yeah, I have, I don't know whether to call it a comment or a question, but you know, when you talk about numbers, it just takes me back to the South African situation, mm -hmm. you know, about the politicians and decision makers that want numbers in order to change policy. Yeah. So, you know, they believe that uh, our energy policy is gender, gender neutral, first of all, mm -hmm. that it doesn't discriminate. But without numbers, we can't prove otherwise. Mm. Uh, and then when we can't prove that women are less likely to afford modern energy services than, 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 than men, then policy doesn't shift, doesn't change. And they, they, they really are convinced that what we have now works and works uh, both for for men and women how do we you know uh, work around that kind of a situation um, and what kind of numbers can can we give and, and in what maybe is the way that these numbers are presented or the situation is presented perhaps not in numbers but in in other ways do you have any ideas on that Joyce well yes that's I mean you're quite yes uh I do think that the, the sort of visual graphic that the SDG uh, 7 is using is very helpful. It's a bit simplistic in one sense, but it does, it does help draw attention. And I think that it, by giving the numbers, uh, then I think that does, that does, I mean, politicians like that and they want to be able to know, but they also want to be able to know how to shift. That they don't want, I mean, they don't want gloom and despondency. Um, they would, they want to see something that's just positive. And I think that's the way that I think also illustrating having good case studies to show what is possible and to done. And of course, you know, that you want to make sure that it's in South Africa, it has to be in the South African context. Uh, so I think that having case studies of illustrations of what can work is, is a good a, a good uh, a good way to go. Yeah, thanks, Joy. Thanks. We're trying. We'll we'll try some of that uh, next day. Because we, <laughs> yeah, but know, I do. We, I mean, we, visual we... visual does help. I think. Yeah, yeah, we're also looking at uh, um, uh, working together with the Stats SA, which is uh, the statistics um, um, uh, department of the country in putting some of these energy poverty and gender questions into their into the uh, national questionnaire that they'll be using mm -hmm. to see what what comes out of there. But we also recognize that, you know, um, um, in-depth interviews also have a lot um, to give with regards to the context that you were referring to, mm -hmm. you know, what, yes. what is the story behind the number, which is quite important. Yes, you mentioned the National Statistics uh, Office. I think that that's also is a key because um, that certainly who collects it in, in, the, U, in the UK, or certainly it's England, England uh, and, and Wales. In, um, and if you remember that one of the things that Energia recommended was a was a process called gender audit mm -hmm. in which um a number of um key um key players at government level did an, a gender audit of energy policies and one of the, the key people in that was somebody from the statistics office if the statistics office isn't is not convinced then it's very difficult to get uh, but then the push is also coming from 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 the sdgs as well is requiring this data. I mean, they, they are, you know, countries are supposed to provide gender disaggregated data in their reporting. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So we've got, we've got some more questions coming up. We've got um, a couple of questions and comments actually directly related to 
to that last conversation. So Jenny, okay. I, I hope you don't mind this, but I, I'm just going to put yours, your question on hold just for a second. Um, so we've got Jane, who's who's basically uh, <laughs> she, she says that uh, actually Joy is saying exactly the same thing as I'm typing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, mixed methods make for for broader evidence and broader communicate uh, comms approaches. Um, but we've got a, a question from uh, Catherine. Uh, oh, okay. And Catherine says that uh, Ntabi has already judged the discussion to answer my okay. question. I mean, just okay. to, uh, to follow up with that, that, the thing that I mentioned about this gender audit, then uh, that's a method that energy are used, which it, it is draw, um, it's much simpler. Some people might have heard of gender budgets. It's a much simpler methodology to, to use. And you can find information out about it on the Energia web, website. Thanks, Joy. So we, we've got a, got a question from Jenny. I don't know whether you want to turn your mic on, Jenny. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm just here being a little bit lazy about uh, typing. Typing is too much. Actually, it extends a little bit from what Jane was saying about the, the mixed methods and Joy. Um, just I'm really pleased to hear some of the aspects that you've highlighted the need to work across methods and disciplines, particularly qualitative mm -hmm. and quantitative field. Um, we often see this as two separate uh, areas and almost some sometimes worrying, but I think it's really um, important to have not only an interdisciplinary, but a, a transdisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. um, and what you mentioned about going to practitioners, being able to frame the problem from um, the, the, the people who are facing the problem rather than just coming with the expert base. So I think part of the from the research side, it's um, us as researchers coming in um, and acknowledging the biases that we have and potentially when we go in, like you mentioned, sleepover um, and, and really understand where, where people's lived experiences are, are coming from. Um, some of the work that we're doing in, uh, in our projects try to consider how can we think about um, gender in uh, rather large integrated assessment models, which you, you tend to see the, the gender aspect disappear. Um, what I wanted also to mention um, is that I'm really also glad to hear what you mentioned about the global north. So I do research in Canada on, on energy and indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And what you mentioned about uh, all women are not equal, absolutely this is the case. Um, and we make an assumption that wealthy countries like Canada um, uh, all communities have um, equal access to energy, um, et cetera, et cetera, but this is not the case. And often I think that um, the challenges that we often say are limited to the global south also happen in different communities in the global north. Even this north-south distinction is I'm a little bit uncom uncomfortable to mention, but there needs to be, I think, much more collaboration on both um, uh, countries that uh, um, have higher GDP and others with lower GDP, I really think there are lessons to learn. Um, and I'm just wondering how we as a research community can move forward without necessarily putting the, the issue of um, like the end users, what you mentioned about the end users being the, the, the focus of topics like um, file, uh, fuel, fuel use, we're thinking of women at the end, not at the beginning of the decision-making process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how can we think about women in the policy design, in those processes? And we have frameworks like the energy justice framework, which makes assumptions that certain institutions are set in place and work. And I'm not sure um, if we need more diverse frameworks that consider um, countries and contexts or even communities within countries, countries that don't have those institutions in place. So I am basically a little bit rambling on, but trying to call for a more diverse set of research framings that don't only come from Western or wealthier countries, which then are kind of duplicated in other regions. I'd like to see more research coming from and research frameworks that are coming from other regions. So this copy and pasting um, of some frameworks sometimes doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah, just wanted to know what are your thoughts about that when you're working with uh, colleagues from, from uh, all around the world? 
Okay. Oh, right. Yes. Thank you, Jenny. That's an interesting set of things that you've uh, you've said. Uh, I think Peter, we need another <laughs> another <laughs> webinar on this. I th first, Jenny. I think thank you for for highlighting the work that goes on in 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 Canada. I've yeah, I've focused primarily on on uh, the yeah, on Europe because that's the place that I know best. But I am of course very aware that there's been some going back quite some time actually of uh, that Canada was very strong on diversity in the workforce and the strengths that that brings to any organization and I think that's something that I you know I have mentioned in in other 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 writings and I think that um, that, that you raise also that there are you know sort of there is a, a range of communities in any country and I it, it, one, I, um, I think that's that's something that we need also to to bring to bring out, and I think it's, I think that that's something that researchers can do is is to to work with those communities, and to work in um, work that brings out the issues as they see with them. So it, it, it does need a thinking about the way that we do research and how we share the results of our, our research um, with, with the communities where we, we work. I mean, I do know people who go back and talk to the communities and say, look, you know, I did my PhD and this is what I got, this is what I got out of it. Um, and this is what is, is you know, so, so there, are, there are ways of sharing, I think. And I think as, as researchers, we can bring those those issues to the to the fore. And I th when you're talking about frameworks, I, the, the framework that I put up at the, on the very last slide is actually work in progress. I mean, this is um, and somebody asked us this uh, mentioned about is this Sovacol? Well, yes, it is Ben Sovacol's. Uh, I mean, he's not the only person who's done this, but it's he's somebody whose name is 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 linked to that framework. But Mariella Feinstra and I have been looking at this and saying, well, you know, this is not very gendered, or you know, and when I'm there now using the word gender, I also mean in an intersectional way as as well. So gender just becomes a shorthand for that. Uh, so I think that you are right that this that this is work in progress. This is something we are really just, I think. I say it, it, it's only been an issue of interest for about 20 years in the global north. So I think that this is something and it's it's something probably that is fits well with the sort of academic research. So to, I think to that this is evolving. So I think you have to watch this space, Jenny. I'm sorry I can't give you a, a more concrete answer than that. But I mean, you, you, you can make a contribution yourself. I mean, you've already, you know, drawn attention to to uh, um, having, you know, not forgetting about the there are other communities who who have different ways of of living, different ways of working. Um, I mean, I think in the UK, you one could immediately point to the Roma community, for example. So that there are other people who, you know, other groups who also deserve their the energy justice as well. Right. Next, thank you, thank you yeah. Joy. Can, can I ask a question? Is that is that allowed? Uh, Joy, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, um, on, on the topic of taking res uh, responsibility, um, but just uh, I mean, we're, we've been noting in the the conversation that um, that it's notable that um, this is a, a heavily kind of uh, women. Um, or, or, the attendance is heavily weighted to women. Uh, the number of speakers that we've been able to enrol um, on this has has been heavily weighted towards women. Um, how do we go about? And this is a tough question. How do we go about getting uh, enrolling men uh, and getting men to take greater responsibility for gender research and uh, kind of progressive gender uh, policies? Do you have any ideas about that? Um, because it's a challenge, right? It's mm. Mm. well, yeah, yes. What to do about oh, solve it? All, solve all our problems, Joy. Solve all our solve problems. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yes, clearly it's and, your uh, responsibility to do that. Yeah, I don't do lottery not... numbers. Um, uh, well, I, 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 Peter, I do think it's changing. That um, I just actually had an email from a 
colleague of mine at the, at the university who I, I gave a lecture for her uh, her course on um, on to technical students on uh, people planet um, uh, profit and she didn't use profit I forget the word she uses um, and I, I talked about one of the things I talked about was was uh, the gender issues in in energy and she just sent me a message saying actually um, the the topic they the the, the um, assessment for the course where they had to do a small project the best one came from three young men who wrote about gender issues in um, in the um, uh, in the DCR and uh, DRC so, so uh, she said you know this is not something you would have expected 20, 20 years ago I mean teaching I taught about women entrepreneurs to um, a, a business group at the UTE business students and I thought oh you know this is going to be a bit heavy there and and the, 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 the primarily male students said why don't we get more of this so I think that young younger younger men see the world in a, a very different way I mean it doesn't always uh, go like that Mariella just had an interview printed about her work in the local Dutch newspaper and the abuse that she has received related to that is it's absolutely incredible but you know that but um, I think I do think that we as teachers have got a responsibility to, to, to do that and I think that um, that bringing this to the fore, the, the topic to the fore changes. So it's also at uh, Chalmers, there is Martin um, Hausmann, I think he is, who does masculinities and, and uh, energy. And I think he's, his work is also very interesting and, and really quite groundbreaking. So I think that's it, that's it. And of course, you'll now write a paper on gender and energy, Peter. Naturally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, you you are at home of a, of a, you know now in Durham. I mean, you know, I wasn't being you know flannel that that uh, that you know Sarah and um, um, Sandra have, have done some excellent work on mm. on energy poverty. So, and but I think it needs to be more gendered. But uh, on, and you know take it a step further into the intersectionality component, and I think you know there you are, there you go. I'll I should, should say it. should say here that I, I was at Durham. I'm now at Northumbria and Newcastle. Um, but oh, that's, uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, okay, I'm still still, right. in, still in the the local area. You've been so, well. You've had yeah, good influence. I still yeah. have a have yeah. a, a foot in the door there. So yeah. Okay. But yeah, um, that's a. It's a really great response as well. Thanks, Joy. Do and I we... think, well, ERSS also, the, the journal is also very, you know, sort of, the, you do get, um, you know, sort of good uh, response in, in there seeing that. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any other questions? Um, yes, we've been going we quite some up? time now. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Levan. <laughs> Oh, oh, I see Ingrid. Oh, oh Ingrid. Oh. <laughs> Ingrid, I didn't see that you were, I've just seen a comment from you. Well, Ingrid, Ingrid Nelson has commented, Ingrid, you, you, you are partly responsible for this presentation. <laughs> yes, uh, that's a great collaboration. Yes. I, I, I think Catherine raised her hand just a second ago. Am I right? Uh -huh. Okay. Sorry. Yes, I did. Um, I actually raised my real hand rather than a virtual hand. I don't know if it missed. Um, it's a bit left field, really. So I, <laughs> so I left it to the end. Uh, you know, didn't want to uh, interrupt the flow of things. But it's. Um, uh, I'm interested. I've I've got a, a student that's interested in looking at gender and the issue of eco anxiety. Um, and I guess I just wondered really if that was something that you'd come across in your work on gender and energies, this idea that, um, uh, that you know, environmental crises, that climate change and so forth can be anxiety inducing. Um, and if there is a, a gendered element to this. Um, so yeah, it's a completely left field question. I appreciate it might not be something you can speak to, but I just wondered if it was something you'd encountered or come across in your work. Not, not specifically in that that context. I mean, one is one. Are women more environmentally aware, conscious than men? Hmm. 
I think that's a, that's that's very yeah the the evidence is very anecdotal. Um, but I have to say when I did a piece of work oh, a number of years ago, which is the first piece of work I did on on Europe women women in an energy sector in Europe, and I found the most enthusiastic group of supporters of nuclear power was a women's group. So I don't think this is necessarily gendered uh, in that, that sense. Mm. But certainly, yeah, st well, stress for anybody is not good. And I mean, I think um, I think that there is there is some evidence. I think if you have to look up in Scandinavia, I think that there is some certainly I would and I would also ask Jenny as well uh, about in Canada, because it's often mm. indigenous people who are um, and I'm thinking of the Somi up in up uh, across the Arctic Circle mm. who are finding quite significant changes to their livelihoods and, and livelihoods, not necessarily in an economic sense, but also in, the, in their way of living. As, and that that will produce its own set of stresses if you feel that your cultural identity is dis, is disappearing. But I'm not. I have to say, I'm not particularly aware of any any direct work on this. But certainly, an interesting area to pursue. Mm. And given mm. you know the sort of recent COP, there's there may be you know sort of a lot more sort of awareness of this this issue. Hmm. Yes. I mean, I you could try. I mean, in a think where sorry, where are you based, Catherine? Oh, I'm at Exeter. Yes, I mean, you could try thinking, looking, see if anybody's looked at communities up in, in uh, the Lake District, for example, because, I mean, they've been, I mean, anyone living in Kokomoz, who's mm. been flooded, I don't know how many times in the last couple of years. So there may well be somebody who's done some research up there. Yeah, that might be, that's, plus, that's a suggestion. That's great. Thank you. That's okay. Well, good luck. And keep, yeah, keep us informed. Yes. Yeah. We've got a, a comment there uh, from Ingrid saying that her friends and colleagues, Sarah uh, Jaquette Ray and Jade Sasser are writing about the eco anxiety concept quite critically. There are oh, of... right. Oh, great. Thanks, Ingrid. Thanks. Did you get that, Catherine? Perfect. Great. Uh, and, and thanks for that, Ingrid. Um, so we've got an, another question from Mathilde, and then we we'll probably need to think about wrapping things up because it's coming up to uh, the half past mark. Mathilde, did you want to turn on your camera? Uh, turn on your microphone. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Yeah. Uh, lovely. Um, it was to bounce back about what uh, Catherine uh, and Joy were discussing a minute ago. Um, I've, my last paper that is under review at the moment uh, was about uh, links between climate action, uh, SDG 13 and SDG 5, uh, gender equality. And uh, the contextuality of this all is extremely, extremely important. Um, and I believe uh, some of uh, Sherilyn McGregor in University of Manchester um, was has had a few students looking into eco anxiety and uh, gender, so quite critically as well. So that was something that was uh, quite interesting. And no, uh, that was it. Just wanted to thank Joy for the talk. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Did you? I presume Catherine got that. So, yes, great. Yeah. Catherine looks like she's desperately writing these things down very quickly. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and Manchester is also home of a lot of good work on energy, on energy poverty uh, research. Uh, and in fact, we've got uh, Saska and um, oh gosh, Stefan. Uh, Stefan's not um, coming to, okay. to talk. Um, oh gosh, why has his name gone out of my head? He's uh, we're friends. Oh, he's also the former um, chair of the, the Energy Geography Research Neil, Group. Neil, Neil, Neil. 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 Oh, Neil. Oh, yes, but Neil's oh. in Liverpool. Oh, he that's embarrassing. Now. Yes, he is. Um, but they're they're also speaking um, later in this uh, this webinar series, so that should be a, an excellent talk to watch out for as well. Um, 
I see Jenny, Jenny uh, Liu has mentioned about uh, psychology uh, mm. and anxiety. Yes, certainly the behavioral scientists are getting very involved in, in, you know, much more involved now, certainly in the northern context of, um, you know, sort of, of, of energy. So I think that's quite a good possibility there. Yeah, we've got a, another link here. Uh, Jenny sent a link, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. from Yukon, yeah, great, thanks. Okay, final chance for final questions before we wrap up. I think we've done pretty well, to be honest, and Joy, you've done magnificently at uh, answering oh, I hope so. this. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yep, yeah, and uh, there are some some rounds of applause uh, oh, virtually as well coming in. Well, thanks uh, for the questions too, and the and people actually popping up. That's really very nice. Yeah, great. Well, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure um, having you here, Joy, and uh, we we really really appreciate it. Um, just a kind of a reiteration we've um we've got a uh, our next talk same time next friday um with uh lisa uh during uh, hopefully i pronounced that right I, I may have totally butchered that i'm sorry if you're uh, here lisa um and that's going to be on household uh, gendered energy practices um should be a really really great talk again um uh, again, the uh, the links in the chat. Please uh, do come along to that. Uh, but otherwise, um, just want to to kind of say thanks again, Joy, and uh, look forward to uh, to kind of hearing more from you in the future. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for having me, and good luck with the rest of the uh, the presentation. So, look, that's a really exciting list uh, you've managed to gather together there. Okay then, and have a good weekend, everybody. Uh, take care. And good yeah. luck with the research. Take care, everyone. And we're looking forward to Peter's paper. Yes. <laughs> no pressure now. Yeah. <laughs> take care. Bye. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.